Can I uh, welcome members, invited guests and the public watching on webcast to today's meeting of the Environment Committee. In accordance with government regulations, we're holding this meeting on a virtual basis with Assembly members and guests participating remotely. I will call Assembly members to speak by name during the question and answer session and I will also introduce each guest shortly. At today's meeting, we will be questioning the Deputy Mayor for Environment and Energy on the impact of COVID-19 on London's environment. We have a short, few short items of formal business to go through first. Can I now ask our clerk, Lauren, to confirm the names of the Assembly members who are virtually present at this meeting and any apologies for absence? Thank you, Chair. Um, the members currently present on this call are yourself, the Chair, Caroline Russell, AM, the Deputy Chair, Leonie Cooper, AM, Tony Arbor, AM, Jeanette Arnold, OBE, AM, Sean Bailey, AM, Nikki Gavron, AM, and David Curtin, AM. We have received no apologies for absence. Thank you. And can I ask the committee to note the list of offices on the report and ask if there are any additional interests to declare? I'll take that as no additional interests. Uh, can I ask the committee to note the membership and chairing arrangements for the committee as set out on the agenda? Yes. Thank you. Can I ask the committee to note the terms of reference for the committee as set out on the agenda? Good. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> Can I ask the committee to note the standing delegations to me as chair as set out on the agenda? Agreed. Thank you. Can I ask the committee to confirm the minutes of the previous meeting held on the 12th of March 2020 to be signed by me as a correct record? Agreed. Thank you very much. And can I ask the committee to note the completed and outstanding actions from previous meetings and the additional correspondence? Agreed. Thank you. And can I ask the committee to note the action taken by me as chair in consultation with the party group leads to agree the committee's report, the climate emergency, extreme weather and emissions? Noted. Thank you. Noted. And can I ask the committee to note the mayor's response to the committee's letter on tube dust? Noted. Thank you. That now brings us to today's main item for discussion, which is the impact of COVID-19 on London's environment. Can I please welcome today's guests, Shirley Rodriguez, who is the Deputy Mayor for Environment and Energy. Welcome, Shirley. Uh, Aaron Wood, who is the Assistant Director for Environment. Elliot Trahan, who is the Head of Air Quality. Peter Dorr, who is the Interim Policy and Programme Manager for Climate Change. Andrew Jones, who is the Policy and Programme Manager for Green Infrastructure. Andrew Dunwoody, who is the Policy and Programme Manager for Waste, Circular Economy and Sustainable Development and James Hardy, who is the Policy and Programme Manager for Energy for Londoners. And before we start our questions, the Deputy Mayor will now make a short opening statement. Shirley, over to you. Thank you. Oh, you're still on mute. Right, That's I great. know what's happening. I'm is that better? That's much better. Thank you very okay, much. Great. Thank you. So the world has changed dramatically since we last met. And at my last appearance, uh, we went through a review of the key achievements of the mayor's first term in office. But since then, the focus has been on the city's response to the COVID pandemic and now what the recovery will look like. Before I give a quick rundown of some of the actions uh, we've been taking, I wanted to first of all say thanks to all of those in the environment team and colleagues in the boroughs, assembly, Transport for London, the London Waste and Recycling Board, Parks for London and businesses. We've all worked incredibly hard despite all the pressures of dealing with the pandemic and lockdown and remote working to ensure that environmental programmes and services continued for Londoners. We ensured the GLA's environment related programmes and services and those delivered by others such as the boroughs were brought to a safe stop or could continue safely taking account of lockdown restrictions. One example being our retrofitting programmes. On, Mace, uh, on waste, the Mayor with the London Waste and Recycling Board and London Councils worked to ensure that essential waste services continued. The bulk of services were largely maintained across London throughout the crisis, despite staff shortages due to illness or shielding. And all services, including the opening of recycling centres, have now resumed as normal. London's parks and green spaces became even more crucial during lockdown with very high levels of usage. 
and the GLA work with Parts for London, the boroughs and others to coordinate responses, messaging and issue best practice guidance. For example, the early and disparate approach on park access was addressed with closures swiftly reversed and the group continues to keep under review the impact on our parks and green spaces. On air quality, we saw traffic across London massively reduce as people listened to advice. The ULES and LES charges were temporarily suspended to help London's critical workers get to work and for essential deliveries to take place. As traffic has increased and lockdown restrictions are being eased, these charges have been reintroduced to prevent one public health crisis being replaced by another. And plans for the extension of the ULES next year continue. In parallel, to allow for social distancing and to take account of the limited capacity on public transport, the Mayor's Street Space Plan has been introduced to enable Londoners to shift their journeys to walking and cycling. And so far, these programmes have seen schemes like the Euston Road and Park Lane implemented, as well as the funding across London of over 200 town centre improvements, over 150 school streets and nearly 40 cycling schemes. And finally, we've also started work on the city's recovery from the pandemic. The Mayor has been clear that London's recovery must be a green one and that a prosperous economic recovery and a green equitable recovery are not mutually exclusive. With London Council, he co-chaired the first London Recovery Board in June and the environment has been identified as a key golden thread, meaning that any activity from the London Board will be viewed through an environmental lens. The Mayor's Green New Deal for Londoners will be one element. It will tackle the climate, ecological and air pollution crises we are facing alongside the inequalities which the pandemic has so clearly highlighted in these areas. It will focus on supporting people as the economic crisis hits, uh, creating new clean jobs and helping Londoners gain the skills they need to access them. And one way we'll be doing this is through the scale up of some of the existing and successful GLA and borough projects and programmes, such as the retrofitting of our homes and buildings, creating and improving our parks and green spaces and the electrification of our transport system. This will be key. Um, and as you'll have seen, we carry on work on some of this. We saw uh, last week the market testing for renewable energy on the tube and in the wider, and the wider public sector, which is an example of how we carry on pressing on with this work. The last five months have been tumultuous. The full economic impacts of the pandemic are yet to be felt. But many polls show that the public see the environment as key to any recovery and that they don't want to return to business as usual. Lockdown has meant that people have valued their local green spaces more become involved in their own communities and appreciated improvements like cleaner air. We will make sure that London's recovery leads to a greener, fairer, more resilient city that works for all its citizens. And I look forward to working with you to achieve this objective. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Shirley, and um, really good to hear um, and to see that the, uh, that the recovery board is going to have a sort of golden thread, as you described it, of looking at everything through an environmental lens, as well as obviously a social justice uh, lens. So um, that's very, uh, very, very positive. Um, and, uh, and you just mentioned uh, the, the TfL uh, energy, fantastic to see that the mayor is going for power purchase agreements to increase the amount of renewable energy um, on the tube. It's long overdue. It was 0.01%, I think, of renewable energy being used. Um, and so if that's now being really um, shifted, that's, that's very, very positive. Um, I just wanted to open by asking you what you think the main environmental challenges are going to be for London in terms of meeting the objectives uh, in the environment strategy. What's the main thing that keeps you up at night thinking that the, the, the pandemic is actually interrupting your ability to, to meet those targets? Uh, thank you, Chair. Well, the pandemic uh, has interrupted the achievement of, of lots of things, not just just environmental targets. And I think, um, as, I, as I've said, you know, the, the, the point of the work on our recovery from the pandemic is really to make sure that all the environmental objectives that are uh, that we set out in the environment strategy and, and reflected in the London plan and the mayor's transport strategy are taken forward. Obviously, the climate emergency is, is, is the pressing one, as is the toxic air pollution in London. And we've, um, Sadiq, the mayor, has said uh, a number of times uh, when he's been talking about the green recovery, that accelerating action on the climate emergency is absolutely critical. But we know also that um, the, um, uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, that, that, that people's susceptibility 
to it and then the long-term impacts have been um, exacerbated there's emerging evidence uh, clearly showing that there is more um, that, that uh, if we were able to deal with the air pollution um, that would reduce impact so we absolutely have to press on with the most priorities of getting the ultra low emission zone uh, in uh, and extended next year um, and we've made a number of um, advances uh, over his term that we talked about last time and are very happy to go into that we need to carry on building. Um, I think the other issue would be increasing access to um, our green spaces. London is blessed with, with a lot of green spaces, but the COVID-19 pandemic has shown that uh, not everybody has uh, equal access. Um, and we've done a lot of good work across um, the last four years, increasing the amount of um, hectares of of green space that people have been accessing, uh, I think something in the order of 400. So we need to do much more um, because, um, you know, God forbid there is another lockdown or uh, other instances that, that, we, that we want to make sure that people enjoy the benefits of those, those green spaces, which we know are absolutely crucial to health, well-being, and so on. Thank you. And um, back in February, the mayor, um, so there was the 50 million fund to support the Green New Deal. Um, first of all, is there any threat to that 50 million fund um, from the budget, um, which has obviously been desperately um, affected by um, the COVID-19 crisis? Um, so yes, is, the, is that 50 million safe and still available and what type of projects are going to be supported by by that fund and have there been any changes to that um, focus um, following the pandemic so as you're aware i think uh, the the mayor has been looking at reprioritizing uh, the 2021 and 21 22 budgets because of the um the massive changes in, in income uh, projections that, that we at the GLA and local authorities are facing through the fall in business rates, for example, and so on, council tax and so on. So um, I can't really comment uh, on that before before that um, uh, before the mayor's decision uh, is issued for I think I believe consultation towards the end of uh, end of the month. However, the mayor has said that the Green New Deal uh, is absolutely critical to London's recovery. Um, it's you know it's part of the the the, the golden thread of environment uh, writ large um, in, in the work of the recovery board. Um, so I I would just say that you know it is a completely key priority for the mayor and uh, you know I can't really comment on the amounts yet, but uh, but we should know shortly. And in terms of the types of projects that you think should be prioritised for this funding. Um, have there been any changes in those priorities since we've been through this first stage of the lockdown and pandemic? Um, yes, sort of, do you, are, do you think your priorities for that funding are, are, are shifting? When the mayor announced uh, the, the funding, um, we gave a sort of illustration of the types of projects that we would want to, to consider and work had started. Um, on, on starting to look at the sort of criteria and the types of projects and how we would um, start to mobilise that funding. Um, but the types of projects we were looking at were around retrofitting, around skills, um, around renewable energy, community energy, um, green spaces, public realm and so on. So, so all the sorts of things that are being considered now as part of the work for the recovery board to consider and opine on. So I don't think there's anything that we wouldn't want to cover. Obviously, the amount of money that was being talked about is not sufficient to cover all of those things. So one of the things that, that we have been doing before, you know, all through the mayor's term, has been lobbying very hard uh, for government to devolve more powers and resources to London to enable us to take action on accelerating the work we're doing on climate emergency, on, on air pollution and so on. Um, and you'll be aware that you know that we've raised many times that either London has been excluded from funding or has not got its fair share of funding, and that that is still continuing as as you no doubt have noticed. Um, but the other part of work that we need to uh, and have been looking at is how do we mobilise more finance, more investment into London, and that's going to be absolutely critical uh, as part of the recovery process. So. Private finance is going to be absolutely critical to boost the sort of infrastructure that we need in London from, from heat networks through to how do we retrofit 
uh, our homes and, and buildings, um, commercial buildings, as well as public sector buildings. And we've been doing work um, with the London Sustainable Development Commission, for example, on what a new financing facility might look like um, and how we might work with, with others. The mayor has already um, mobilised half a billion pounds worth of funding for his energy efficiency fund, um, but that's nowhere near enough um, to, to be dealing with all the sorts of things that we need to be doing to um, tackle the climate emergency. Um, for example, our one and a half degree plan estimated we need in the order of 61 billion pounds worth of funding. Um, the level of government funding that we're seeing on, on this area is nowhere near sufficient. Mm -hmm. And um, the mayor has called very clearly um, alongside the other um, C40 cities to not return to business as usual after COVID-19. Have you got particular plans for how you are going to be able to avoid returning to business as usual? We're already seeing the traffic levels going up and, um, uh, uh, um, yeah, kind of, you know, some of those benefits of the environmental benefits of the lockdown period of quieter skies, quieter roads, cleaner air, beginning to dissipate. Um, so, yes, sort of how are you going to make sure that, uh, that, we, that we don't go back to business as usual and that we, we, we move into a, a new way of running our city? I wouldn't say it was. it's a new way of running our city. The, the policies that the mayor has set out and the programmes that we've been implementing are very, very much about um, regaining the leadership that, that London had on, on being, you know, the greener city. Um, the work that we've been doing on EULA is the accelerated work on air quality policies. And I talked a little bit about the, the um, evaluation of the, the work we had done um, on the impact that we had done on air quality, the work that we've been doing on green spaces, the work we've been doing on retrofitting and tackling the climate emergency. Um, all of those things are, are things that, um, you know, we're, we're carrying on and we were trying to push harder and faster on, which is why the mayor talked about a Green New Deal fund uh, to do even more work in this area. Um, obviously, the, the, the pandemic and the, the related lockdown has meant um, some progress has stalled and or been paused whilst we sort of safely locked down programmes and, and, you know, we're now starting to, re, you know, to restart that. But that's in the context of a very different world. So we're having to look to see how we might uh, return to some of those programs and get them going faster. Um, you know, so the, the stimulus packages that government have been talking about, um, you know, we are absolutely saying that we can, you know, we can spend that money in London. We have great ideas. We've shown great leadership in these areas. And if, you know, the government wants to meet its 2050 target, for example, on, uh, on uh, greenhouse gas emissions, or its targets on air pollution, where it's failing. You know, there are things that in London we can do to help, and we have been doing a lot to help uh, government meet its targets. So I would say, um, you know, that the mayor has been very clear that we we didn't want business as usual. That the green recovery has to be tackling the issues that I talked about before about air pollution and the climate emergency. What we need is government help to give us the powers and the resources to to move faster. And we're, you know, but we're not waiting for government to do that. We have been pushing fast and fast, uh, you know, with our own resources where we've got them to, to, to make sure that we make, we make a big impact, for example, on air, uh, air quality. Thank you. Um, I've just had a note that Leonie Cooper would like to come in with mm. an additional question here. Right, thanks, Caroline. Um, I, I just wondered if the Deputy Mayor would comment on um, the amount of money that came from the summer statement from government i mean i think the total figure that we're talking about now for um hs2 uh, is 106 billion and yet the amount that um has come in the government stimulus package for green initiatives as i understand it is 3 billion nationally 2 billion for um, green homes retrofit and, and an extra billion do you think that's really enough do you think the government is actually taking the idea of a climate emergency Seriously, it doesn't really feel as though they're giving as much towards the kind of things that you've just been running through that the mayor has been focusing on. No, I, I would agree that, you know, it's a missed opportunity. Now, I, I hope that was just the, the first instalment, the down payment of a, 
a bigger package that, that has been promised. But the levels of funding that we've seen, and there's been some talk about it being repackaged funding, so it's not actually new money, um, or not very much new money, um, is nowhere near enough. I've, or, you know, in London, um, the estimate is 61 billion, uh, 10 billion alone just to retrofit our homes. Um, you know, and, and nationally, it's going to be much, much more than that. Um, the CCC, I think, of the Climate Change Committee have made some estimates on this. So. And, and it's a missed opportunity because we know that we are facing huge economic impacts that um, that are coming. People are going to be losing their jobs. And we we have talked previously anyway that in order to um, uh, meet our greenhouse gas emissions, we need to be moving people, um, retraining, creating new jobs. The, this money will, will help do that. And it will help across the country. So meeting, you know, contributing towards the government's levelling up agenda. So, for example, the zero emission capable taxis policy that the mayor introduced has driven not only uh, the creation of uh, a new factory in Anstey, uh, which is creating jobs up in the Midlands, um, as well as obviously um, helping tackle air pollution and reduce carbon emissions uh, uh, where, where those taxes are being used here in London. But that, that factory had brought in inward investment from, from abroad and it started to um, you know, before the pandemic, they they were going to open up a line on uh, electric vans. So, you know, huge investment. And that's the sort of investment and imagination and ambition that the mayor is showing. And that's the investment, ambition and imagination that we want government to be showing, because this is going to help benefit the whole country if we can drive these policies forward. And we know they work because they are working in London. Yep. But thanks very much, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, I've also got an indication from uh, Assembly Member Bailey um, who wants to come in. Sean, if I can ask you to be brief because we are um, we're at running to quite a time, tight time clock today. Can you hear me, Chair? Yes. One question. How much money would you like from the government? Because many of your answers have talked about how you, you're seeking more and more funding from the government. Do you have a total of how much money you'd like? to receive from the government for London to continue these these um, initiatives that you're speaking about? We've always said that we want London's fair share of funding um, allocated to London. And the estimates of what is needed in London in order to meet, for example, the one and a half degree pathway is £61 billion pounds worth of investment. Now, that is not all funding. That is a combination of private and public sector finance. Obviously, public sector finance will leverage private sector finance. But that's the estimate of what is needed in order to meet the one and a half degree pathway in London, which contributes to the national government's 2050 target. So that 61 billion, exactly how much of that would be grant, you know, would the government actually have to stump up and over, over, over what period, please? Well, it depends on what projects are going to be um, funded and how that's going to be funded. So I talked about, for example, the retrofitting um, needed to, to happen in London, 10 billion pounds worth. Um, if we were to get um, a fair share of that funding uh, for London, then that would help boost um, the the confidence of the private sector and pension funds and so on to to contribute to the funding uh, in London. Do you, I think what I'm asking for is, do you have a, a, an idea of what you would want in what sequence? Because it's hard to go to anybody, a government or anybody else, and ask for money if you can't tell them how much you want and when you want it. So do you have a, a wish list, a procedural list that says what you think is the priority for London, what that would cost and when you'd like the money? I, I understand because the chair needs to move on, but that list would be useful because it, it, it feels unhelpful to continually say we want money okay fine how much and when then we could all help out couldn't we, so we okay thank you um are we leaving that as a question sitting there or uh, shirley do you want to just give a brief response in terms of is there any more you want to say apart from 61 billion fair share would equate to 1.1 .1 billion the timing of that and how it on retrofit, for example, uh, is sequenced depending on when that money becomes available. And, you know, obviously we've talked about we have accelerator programmes, for example, uh, that exist already. So we know we can put some money into those and scale those up. But in order to fully fund the hundreds of thousands of homes that need to be retrofitted each year, then that would need more scaling up, procurement and so on. So it'd be over two to three years, I guess. Um, but um, 
uh, you know, but we, we do have a wish list of what we need in London. And that's been set out in our one and a half degree plan, which goes line by line through, for example, what we need for heat networks, heat pumps, electrification and so on. That's the order, as I said, the order of investment that's needed in London. Um, and then that sort of depends on what um, what government allocates to us. But uh, very happy to go back to you, uh, Assembly Member Bailey with um, and Assembly Member Russell with some more information. I, I, I'd, I'd love that sort of costed look at what, what you'd want and in a sequence. I think it'd be helpful. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Assembly Member Bailey, and um, uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I'm now going to bring in Assembly Member Arnold um, on air quality. Aha, uh -huh. good morning, Chair. Good morning, Deputy. Good morning. Good morning. Nice. Always good to see you. Um, I've got um, a number of questions about air quality. Um, as you know, it's uh, it's something that I, um, as one of the one of the millions of chronic um, asthmatics, uh, where it's of interest to us, many of us have no ideas when we will. Um, escape imprisonment from our homes um, because of our conditions and because of the level of pollution and can I just I mean just from a personal point of view you know looking out and during that time seeing clear skies over London and the rest of the world and then seeing the figures you just thought well isn't this wonderful because I could actually breathe well and um, I could, uh, my, my well-being would improve. And then, of course, um, what, what I, can't, I couldn't get over is immediately there was, if you like, um, some sort of opening and people were allowed to move. Um, we started to see that move away from the levels that we'd seen that were possible, such wonderful high levels. Um, you know, you just focus on nitrous, nit nitrogen dioxide, which, as we know, is something that really impacts on our breathing and our well-being. Okay. And, uh, and um, yeah, there were some magical picture uh, images of, of our children reclaiming the streets and people out there. So, um, you know, uh, I'm sure that you were really encouraged by all of this. So has that become the new marker? Is it possible for London to say, we've seen what it's like, and then that's the point we're going to be like saying, you know, if we go too low, too high, then that will be our baseline. Um, can you give us any assurance that this new awareness, this new sense of what can happen, that is the new baseline? Thank you, Councillor uh, Assemblymember Arland. Uh, absolutely, the the um, impacts of COVID-19 and the lockdown are the things that we want to re-achieve because we're already we're seeing those um, benefits, that air pollution reduction being eroded as we start to see more traffic coming back. You know, uh, polluting traffic coming back. That was a was an overnight practically sort of impact and it's very hard to see how you would get back to that uh, in that sort of time frame without another lockdown for example however the mayor has been very clear that he uh, wants to um, reduce our air pollution and in fact you know it's really clear that he would love to eradicate air pollution from our city however um, that needs and we've talked about this many times before um, the sorts of support from government um, to help us do that but irrespective of that, we've made great, uh, um, had great uh, improvements in London over the last uh, four, four, four and a half years. Um, we've seen um, a third reduction in, in NO2, and then the lockdown has um, added a, a sort of further element of around, I think, 26%. I think it's, um, let me just check the figure, there's an additional reduction of 26%. And this is all in central London, of course, um, and sort of bigger reductions at certain sites. Um, but the policies that we've been bringing in from, you know, cleaning up our buses, cleaning up our taxis um, have had dramatic improvements and really helped reduce 
the amount of um, incidences of air pollution that we've been seeing. Do you remember, you know, um, in, new, in New Year, you'd see a breach of the, the air pollution limits, you know, within days of New Year. Now, we, you know, we've been going into practically June, you know, uh, from, from the last data. So lots of improvements. And it's absolutely clear that the clean air zones, the ultra low emission zone has been instrumental in, in doing that. And it's a policy that the government has seen and has recommended to other cities because it works. You know, it is a it is a, a proportionate way of dealing with uh, air pollution, targeting the most um, polluting vehicles, um, but through a charging mechanism, not not a ban. And that has really worked. But uh, we need to do much more. And, you know, the mayor would love to see and has been lobbying very hard, for example, the WHO target for PM 2.5 to be incorporated into the environment bill. Uh, we're, we're not seeing any progress from government um, on that. Um, and, and really that is absolutely key to really tackling the air pollution. As, and and you're from your personal experience, Council, uh, Assembly Member Arnold um, and many others, we know that um, the susceptibility of people to respiratory illnesses and then to, to, to um, COVID is exacerbated by by air pollution so you know there's a there's a sort of moral duty for us to tackle um all the sources with those known solutions that we know that work and are being implemented now well thank you for that um, and uh, it's great to hear about the strategic overview can i just ask a couple of questions on local specifics because mm -hmm. sometimes we just want to know what is um for me the the mayor is TFL. TFL is the mayor, right? So when I talk about TFL, uh, I'm I'm referring to the mayor. So in advance, for, so for example, in in advance uh, in advance of schools reopening in September, are you proactively working um, or task TFL to work with boroughs to roll out more school streets? Um, because uh, surely in September we focused on in school. But what about those cars coming outside schools? What about the children arriving? Um, and, you know, uh, so that outside schools is as important an area to keep the, the level of pollution down. Um, can you say anything briefly about the work that you'll be doing with boroughs and uh, through TFL about local implementation plans or anything like that? Yeah, it's absolutely critical to to the work of, of tackling air pollution, but also climate change and, you know, all the other co-benefits that reducing uh, polluting uh, traffic brings. Um, and there'd been a lot of work already. You know, we, we had funded through the GLA uh, work on um, air quality audits and then sort of measures that, that schools could bring in working with their local authorities and provided some funding for that. Um, subsequently, Transport for London has been uh, looking at some of those things. And then through the um, street space plan that I mentioned earlier, the mayor has funded um, through Transport for London a number of school streets. And we've been really encouraged by the number of boroughs that have come forward and said that they wanted to bring in school streets. Um, whole boroughs are doing them, you know, and said they're going to fund some of them themselves, uh, which is brilliant. And you're right, you know, we can't be tackling um, uh, sort of air pollution sort of intermittently these these are things that everybody has to play a part in so absolutely and and the the work that the street space plan is is doing about helping people move out of using their cars and and walking and cycling more because of you know uh, to um, enable safe uh, social distancing and and also um free up transport on the tube or, or the bus network for other more for, for journeys for people who can't can't uh, can't do that has been absolutely critical. Now, these these are all emergency uh, works under emergency orders, but we're seeing so many people saying they like them that, mm -hmm. you know, and this is what local authorities have to listen to and, you know, and try and embed them. We would love to see these as more legacy um, improvements and building in some of the work that we're doing on green spaces and uh, climate resilience as well, so that they become areas that people can use to to go out their homes and and um you know go to the local shops increase footfall and so on um but you know those will uh require the local authorities to 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 talk to their residents about how they make them more permanent yes and chair i've just got two quick two mm. uh, two more quick questions um we, we've, we've, you, you mentioned the congestion charging zone um can you or the mayor reveal the assumptions um, of TfL's modelling that predicts a doubling in traffic in the congestion charging zone. 
uh, and how much margin for error has been accounted for? I would have to get TfL to write to you on that because I yes. don't have that information to hand, I'm afraid, but, but okay. very happy to ask them to do that. that okay, and, and I think you've, you've talked, um, indeed in your introduction and in, in answers to questions about this commitment to counteract any rise um, in emissions from renewed traffic, but I'm going to push you again. Uh, uh, what sort of levels are you saying? Uh, I'm going back to, we, we absolutely know what it's like We've, um, it's, it's not, we, we don't have to guesstimate. We, we've been there, we've had that opportunity. So what sort of margins are you now working to, um, to say that you would then start to, you know, become quite alarmed and be looking for, you know, interventions um, to, to stop us going back to where we were. I think there is a huge movement saying, we do not want to go back to where we were before because we've seen the possibility. So we have, uh, I'm going to ask Elliot to jump in, in here in a minute, but, but at the very least, we want to, to make sure that the emissions reductions we had seen before lockdown, that we had secured through policies like the ultra low emission zone, through the work like low emission bus zones, um, you know, the ZEC taxi regulation, all of those sorts of things, that that, that is where, you know, we, we want to make sure that we don't go back from that. Then it was what we already said in the in the um, uh, in the mayor's environment strategy that we want to go further and meet um, the um, various targets that, that we've been setting in London that, have, that are set at national level. Um, the, the EU targets that have been um, transcribed into into UK law, but then to go further and ultimately, you know, like net zero, we should be having a, a, an ambition to eradicate air pollution, not least because of the the, the, the terrible um, impacts it has on on shortening people's lives and 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 in fact, you know, uh, killing them. Elliot, is there anything else that you want to add in terms of um, Assembly Member Arnold's question? Yeah, just uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, just to pick up very quickly on um, what Shirley was saying in relation to um, the importance of expanding EULAs and the tightening of the low emission zone, we we're expecting that to bring about a reduction in NOx emissions in inner and outer London of around 30%. Mm -hmm. So it gives you a sense of the significant additional benefits we can still get mm -hmm. from expanding uh, the EULAs and tightening the existing low emission zones. So that's why as Shirley was explaining, it's so important we remain focused on delivering those, you know, very big impact interventions, as well as continuing to reduce emissions from the bus and taxi fleets. And in terms of targets, as you know, we are absolutely committed to achieving legal co compliance with nitrogen dioxide uh, by 2025, and also then uh, meeting WHO recommended guidelines for PM 2.5 by 2030. And, and Thinking about how that would uh, in achieving that requires a real transformation in the air that we would breathe and would require additional action, including on non-transport sources. And this is where the point Shirley has been making about additional powers comes in. This is where we'll need to be able to address actions from construction or from wood burning uh, or from buildings and the river. And at the moment, we don't have the same powers we do over the transport uh, set of emissions. And that's going to be really important if we're going to make additional progress to get to where rightly you say we should be, which is, you know, um, London is having access to clean air every day, not just during a lockdown. Thank you very much, Ma. I thank you. My lungs thank you and look forward to zero emissions. <laughs> <laughs> and millions of lungs thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Jeanette. I'm now going to move on to uh, Assemblymember Curtin, who has some further questions on air pollution. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone. Um, okay. First of all, I'd like to ask about the buses, and I know um, your plan is to make the entire bus, bus fleet um, Euro 6 compliant by this year, 2020, but with the coronavirus situation and the effect that that's had on TfL's finances, has that affected your plans to upgrade the bus fleet uh, to Euro 6 standard? No, I think we're still to, to, to keep on track, but obviously um, the timing uh, of, of when we wanted to do that um, is, is, is being affected by um, uh, the supply chain 
you know, and, and, their, and the impact that COVID and lockdown has had on them. So the um, colleagues at Transport for London, the, the, the head of buses and so on, are talking to those suppliers to see what, what the, the new timelines will be. Um, and, uh, you know, we can come back to you on that when we've got more information. But the intention is absolutely to carry on because it is so important. The bus emissions, um, uh, you know, have really contributed so much to, to reducing um, air pollution in London, um, and obviously the ambition is to 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 move to to zero emission buses um, in due course. But in the meantime, that's had a great impact. So so really the focus is now on on how do we deal with polluting um, uh, cars and vans, which is uh, um, you know the, the the other source of, of vehicles uh, vehicle pollution. Okay, how many buses do you still have to work on to get them up to Euro six standards? I can't remember offhand, but I think um, I think we were talking about three thousand buses, and we'd done pretty much ninety-five percent before lockdown, so we didn't have a, a huge number left to do. But obviously affected by by supply chain issues, Elliot. I don't know if you know that number. If not, we can definitely write to you after the committee. Um, I'd rather rather than potentially give you an incorrect number, I'd rather we just write with the accurate number after the meeting, if that's okay. Okay, so so you're saying that. So the six, the bus fleet, as I understand, is is nine thousand approximately. Is that right? Uh, that's my recollection. Yes. Yeah. I'm just trying hey, to check hey. the briefing to see if yeah. I've got anything. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just trying to understand. So the bus fleet's nine thousand. You had to upgrade three thousand, and you've already done work on perhaps ninety-five percent, but you're not sure. Uh, the ninety-five percent of the three thousand, but you're not sure of the number. Okay. So there's um possibly um another 150 or so buses to work on but you're not sure of the number you, you As a, i can't give it to you right now but we can no. uh, write to you straight after the committee to okay let you know. that's fine so so you're kind of saying then that the issue is not money but it's supply chain um issues for those remaining buses my understanding and i'd have to talk to transport for london uh to 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 confirm this and we can write to you after this is because you know everything closed down to get those supply chains going and started up again and then you know looking at reorder dates and all of those things um you know we're not going to um you know, we're aiming to make sure that it's done in 2020, mm. but we can't. Be, I can't confidently give you the answer that we will do that now until I've had that information from Transport for London. Okay, well, it would be good for you to, to write to us to let us know. Thank you. Right. Um, we'll do. Well, I'll, I'll move on. Um, so, just just another question is: um, Has the the coronavirus impacted your ability to tackle the um, achieving legal compliance with the? UK and EU limits. I, mean, I know you mentioned a little bit about the, that in uh, your answers to Assemblymember Arnold, um, particularly with nitrogen dioxide. Um, the, the legal limit there is 40 um, micrograms per cubic metre on an annual mean average. Mm -hmm. um, what's the figure been for nitrogen dioxide levels this year so far? Do you know? And um, has the coronavirus impacted your uh, ability to to change that number at all? I think it's it's a bit difficult to say because obviously you, you, if you measure uh, the the impact, it's it's a snapshot. So to actually get a proper series of uh, or proper information, we'd need to take a, a bit longer um, mm -hmm. set of data in order to tell you you know to give you that answer. And Elliot can you can jump in mm -hmm. here. Um, but, you know, as you said before, pre-lockdown, we'd seen significant falls in, in NO2 because of the mayor's policies. Post-lockdown, there was a snapshot, I think, that we issued that showed um, how diff what a difference that made. But whether that's sustained or not really depends on, on um, our policies to, to try and um, encourage people to use uh, walking and cycling and, and public transport uh, and come out of their polluting vehicles. Um, that, that's, you know, whether, how much that's made of a difference. Elliot, is there anything? Um, so if you give me a moment, I'll be able to give you the number, but just one moment, please. Okay. So if you carry on, maybe I'll come back to that in one moment. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm just thinking, so, I mean, nitrogen dioxide is one of the, the things that you talk about a lot. And um, the PM2.5s 
uh, were already meeting uh, the UK legal limit. Um, I know you, you talk about the WHO limit, but they're already meeting the EU limit and the UK limit. But what about some of the other pollutants that we don't really talk about too much, such as ozone, sulfur dioxide, benzene, lead, butyl-1,3-diene? Are they all under the limits still? And will coronavirus have any impact on their levels? Again, I think it's it's too early to say what the impact of coronavirus has had on those things. So there, there are lots of different sources of those those emissions. Um, we know, you know, well, we're pretty sure that you know the reduction in polluting traffic has helped bring down um, air pollution. Um, but whether it's had the same effect on all, all those other pollutants is is another matter. Um, you know, ozone is is partly dependent on 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 the weather and, and sunlight. Um, we've got ammonia emissions that are coming in uh, to London from agriculture, and this is something that we've raised with government on the Environment Bill, and been pressing them to take action on that, and still, um, you know, no progress on that. Um, so, so lots of different sources and lots of different reasons. So again, I think we we we'd need much more data to be absolutely confident to work out yeah. how much of an impact. COVID has had on, uh, and the lockdown particularly rather, has mm. had on, on, on emissions. Elliot, is that is that fair to say? Yeah, so just to echo a little bit of what Shirley said, sorry for the delay, but I have now have no the number you're asking for, Assemblymember Curtin. So uh, the annual average NO2 in 2016 was around 50 micrograms. In 2019, that came down to 39 micrograms. We obviously, we don't have an average for 2020 yet because it's done over the course of mm. the year. What that tells you, of course, is the scale of progress that we've been able to make in London in terms of NO2 since 2016. But of course, with the annual average across the whole city, you do have to be cautious because various hotspots and locations which continue to exceed uh, those locations will be within those figures. Mm -hmm. But it does give you a sense about um, of the progress that we've made on a London-wide basis. But of course, we continue to have sites which exceed um, the legal limits, and we continue to have modelled locations which exceed those locations, which, uh, exceed those limits, which is why it's so important uh, that we continue to take robust action. Mm -hmm. In terms of, you're quite right, there is a, you know, an incredible real life experiment that's been taking place this year in terms of air pollution. And as Shirley was explaining, we're going to take a little bit longer to try and fully understand how that translates into uh, concentrations over the course of this year in terms of the remaining challenge that we have. And I think you also raised a really interesting point around ozone as one example of where historically, because of the levels of, uh, of NOx and nitrogen dioxide we've had in London, um, we haven't actually really seen very much of an ozone problem. But we did experience uh, in the last uh, month or so a high ozone pollution episode because of the um, reduction in the amount of, of NO2 and NOx, which then, of course, because of the complicated chemistry that takes place, resulted in an increase in ozone levels. So there's so much happening at the moment. We are trying to kind of properly and fully understand it, and we'll be publishing a further report with more information about what we now know, which will probably be happening in around the September time. Mm. Okay, interesting. Ozone, of course, is, is quite a... Um a big absorber of infrared radiation. So, you know, if you're, you're talking about um, uh, absorption in, in that level, that's uh, it's something to look out for. Um, so, I mean, Shirley, so, as um, Deputy Mayor, I know you, you said earlier that, um, you know, because of the supply chains, that may have affected the um, delivery of of upgrading the buses i mean so you're going to find out about that but are there any other things that uh, you've had to postpone because of the coronavirus um situation in terms of um increasing uh, air quality um well as i as i mentioned at the uh, in my remarks at the beginning there are a number of programs that we've had to pause um, so, for example, our retrofitting programs, which look at, um, um, you know, putting in energy efficiency measures, you know, cleaner, more up to date boilers, which will reduce emissions, um, for example, um, you know, some of those things we've had to pause because of the restrictions on people being able to go to people's homes and so on. Mm -hmm. But um, the team were, were brilliant and, and, you know, in, in terms of coming up with the contractors on some, some innovative ways to keep the sort of 
pipeline going and we, we made sure that where there were people that had broken boilers for example that, that you know they were remedied you know um, with with safe social distancing measures but um, as we as lockdown restrictions are being eased you know we're working with our contractors uh, in order to start ramping that up so inevitably we've mm. lost what three to four months so you know mm. the the pipeline and the, the sort of momentum that we had underway is has been reduced and, and you know we're obviously going to be trying to play catch up but I'm not sure we'll be able to do that completely but you know in within 2020 but over time I'm sure we will do because it's so so important okay thanks um well one one last question on a, on a different uh, topic which is bonfires um the bonfires um, produce emissions as well particularly of, of particulate matter um have you noticed an increase in in bonfires during the lockdown and uh, is there anything you can do to discourage that and is that something that you think is worth doing? Um, we've had anecdotal information I think about you know bonfires um, people partly because um, some some boroughs had garden waste collections that, that, that were suspended but um, uh, so people burning their their refuse or you know whatever they were doing I don't know but um, um, but again, we'd have to, you know, look at the yeah, yeah. data on that. Um, and we have said, and you know, that, that really people should be using the resources, you know, the services that that, that people um, have available to them in order so that we don't create um, that that sort of air pollution menace mm. that, that, that that produces. So that really we've been able to work with the London Waste and Recycling Board and with local authorities to keep the messaging out there that, mm. you know, during lockdown, it was like try and hold on to your garden waste until services resume. And now they've resumed, then, you know, you can, you know, you can get rid of them um, safely and without affecting your, your neighbour's health. OK, well, thank you. Thank you. I'll pass back to the chair now. Thank you, uh, Assemblymember Curtin. Just before I move on to um, Assemblymember Bailey to talk about aviation, um, I just wanted to pick up one final thing on air pollution. Um, uh, Shirley, you mentioned uh, all the measures, the very welcome measures the Mayor's doing to make it easier and safer for people to walk and cycle, in particular low traffic neighbourhoods, there's pop-up bike lanes and there's also the space for physical distancing on high streets, which has all been very welcome. Um, I am beginning to pick up some uh, negative responses from people, to particularly to the low traffic neighbourhoods. And I'm just wondering if there's more work that you could be doing to explain how the measures like a low traffic neighbourhood is actually being done as an emergency response to the pandemic so that there's a wider understanding of the need that you can still drive to every home within a low traffic neighbourhood but the point of closing it off for through traffic is to reduce the amount of journeys that get made in in vehicles to help to reduce the pollution levels and that doesn't in given some of the pushback that is coming uh, to some of the low traffic neighbourhood work um, I'm, I get the feeling that people haven't fully understood that and I'm just wondering if you or the mayor can can actually do a bit more communication about why these measures these transport measures are being done to actually help people to be able people like Jeanette to be able to get out of her home <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, the government have issued guidance, Transport for London have issued guidance um, to local authorities in bringing these in. And part of that is about communicating um, the fact that they are under emergency measures and, you know, that, that they're being brought in for, for this reason um, and that they are, you know, temporary measures, but hopefully we would make them permanent. So I'm very happy to take that um, back. And, and I should also say pay tribute to Heidi, uh, Alexander and Will Norman, who've been, you know, absolutely... Um, legend i guess in in taking this 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 work forward and, and it is it is very popular i understand you know there are sometimes things that don't work and the point is for local authorities who are bringing these in to 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 listen to those and and my understanding is you know those boroughs are very very um open to listening to when things aren't working to try and improve them but the ultimate benefit as you say is um is in order to help people deal with lockdown and and to reduce air pollution Thank you. And um, Assemblymember Arnold, you wanted to come in. Yeah, yes, Chair, I think we, we should take learning from what happened with the Mini Holland. Mm. And one of the things we have to get right 
is everybody has to be on the same page. And so it is absolutely not a good day for someone who is having to get used to new ways of being in, in their established location for anyone, Will Norman or Heidi or yourself or the mayor, to be shouting out, this is marvellous, this is wonderful, and no sort of indication that, yes, this will disrupt lives, you know, and it's for the greater good. Um, because they're, they're, of course, uh, when you ask people to change their behaviours, change their habits, it's difficult. And, and I don't know that we have really taken on the learning that is there from the mini Holland. And I would just um, follow up the chair and say, absolutely. I, um, it, I, I'm not standing again, but I'm sure I would have lost some votes because I've been quite clear and I've stood up for this change and said, yes, it will be disruptive, but this is for the greater good. And I think it's just an acknowledgement that there are people who will have to change their lifestyles or their ways, you know, their daily routines. And if we could just make some acknowledgement of that on occasions, um, a little bit, be a little bit humble about it, I think that would help us to go through. Thank you, Assemblymember Arnold. Uh, Shirley, do you want to come back on that or should we move to the next? I, I take your point and, and I, I'll feed that back to to um, to Transport for London uh, colleagues. And I think, you know, the point is these are these are fast changes that, you know, for, for as you say, a very good reason. Uh, and we should be talking about the fact that these are emergency measures and so on. But but ultimately, uh, you know, the Millie Hollands were, were a case in point. Um, when you go and talk to people now, they, they love them because they can see the benefits from, from them. But there's always that sort of resistance, I think, for, for some people uh, to change. But but once it's gone in and people have lived with it a little bit, you know, people understand the benefits. Um, yeah, absolutely. So demonstration projects are absolutely critical. Yeah. No, I think that that's why I raised it. I think it is just, you know, it is that the importance of making sure that everyone feels heard, but also that the, the reasons behind doing it uh, and the way it can help us be more resilient to the pandemic um, needs to be made very, very clear in, in the communications. Um, Assemblymember Bailey, I'm going to bring in now, um, and we're moving on to look at aviation. Um, thank you, Chair. Just before I speak about aviation, I'd just like to make the point to follow up from my colleague, um, uh, Janet Arnold. Um, you, you, you made this statement, um, Deputy Mayor, that they are temporary emergency measures that you hope become permanent. There's a real tension there, isn't there? So when people give up local space temporarily, they do it under one set of beliefs. If you're looking to make them permanent, that's a completely different question. And that's where you lose the comparison with the Mini Hollands, because the Mini Hollands were talked about how they would exist in perpetuity. And I believe if you're going to convince people to do things like this, there has to be a, 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 a reality there. You have to tell people the truth. Is it a permanent installation or is it or is it um semi-permanent because that makes a very big difference excuse me as to how it is received by local people i would believe because putting in something quickly because it's not going to be permanent is fine if it's going to be permanent i think you need um longer and more realistic consultation Th that would be sure. my Th so just, just to come back on that we you know the boroughs and we've put these in you know absolutely clearly as emergency temporary measures if people like them and many people do like them um, and um, have been communicating that, and maybe not as many numbers or vocally as, as those who, in some areas, who are against them, then it's for the local authorities to do the normal consultation about uh, closures uh, as they would normally do to make them permanent. All, all I'm saying is that um, it's absolutely clear that the, you know, the, it does help, for example, on road safety, on air pollution, you know, and, and making streets more livable. Um, and we've seen lots of, um, you know, um, sort of uh, people talking about that. Uh, and, and these are the sorts of things that, that, that would make um, uh, our city more zero emission, zero pollution and so on. So I would like to see many of those uh, areas become more permanent, but obviously subject to the local consultations that, that would normally have to take place. And we're going to move on, but that's my point. I think I think a real more realistic conversation, more truthful conversation needs to be had and it has to be a, a, a an overall plan because you, you know better than anybody else. You change something in one area, it has an impact in else, elsewhere. But let, let's move on. 
Uh, I'd just say that we that I think the boroughs and we have been very truthful about these being emergency measures and that they are, uh, if they want to be more permanent, then well, they have to go through the usual consultation. It, it, it's process. a whole other debate and, and the chair and the chair has a goal to arrive at. We'll, we'll, we'll have that offline, Shirley. Um, since lockdown, noise pollution, of course, from flights has been massively reduced. What can the mayor do to support local residents to keep noise levels so they don't go back to pre-lockdown levels? So this is, um, you know, and I, you know, I, I, I am a, um, you know, I have personal experience of this. I am on a flight path to, to Heathrow, and it has been absolutely amazing to, to, to sort of wake up in the morning to birdsong at about four o'clock in the morning, as opposed to the usual approach to, to Heathrow as people were sort of trying to get in, in, in for their slots and circling. So, so it's very, it's a very, you know, important issue to Londoners, and the mayor has made it very clear that. That he, you know, that he would like government to do more on this, but he doesn't have any powers in this respect. So he has campaigned and lobbied for a noise regulator um, to be to be um, to to be established by 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 government, um, and we've made various um, uh, representations uh, in consultation documents and so on, um, and he will continue to do that. Um, so any help that this committee can give in making and raising that issue with government and, and with the regulators, the Civil Aviation Authority and others, would be very welcome. OK, thank you for that. With less flying in the immediate future, there could be significant job losses for airports and, and the knock-on effect for our economy as well, because there's a tension there, isn't there? Because we have a visitor economy in London. I believe our, our record for an annual level of visits is, is beyond 25 million. And that's going to be a huge, huge loss to our economy. Um, what can the mayor do there to prevent as much of that loss, those job losses as possible? And how can you pick some of that up? Because you talk about a green recovery, but the loss is very immediate. A green recovery, and, and this is an ask, not a tell, may take some time. So what can the mayor do to mitigate some of that pain, quite frankly? Well, the mayor has been calling on on government to look at um, targeted sectoral packages as part of the uh, recovery work that the government is is talking about. So, extending furlough schemes and looking at targeted support for for those areas of the economy which are being particularly hard hit, and that that includes the aviation sector, particularly um, you know for London out at, out in West London. Um, and then what we've also been trying to do as part of the recovery efforts is start to to look at how we might start to think about where where um, some of those workers could be um, retrained into different types of jobs and retrofitting is is you know not a comparable situation but you know there are a number of other jobs that we, we are working with our economic development colleagues with our businesses with many of the members of the London recovery board from London first and others to think about um, alternative um, uh, routes to employment reskilling and retraining do we have any idea what size of job losses we could be looking at in any particular industry? So, for instance, we have our aviation support network, anything from people who actually work on planes to people who, who, who make the airport work, et cetera, et cetera. Do we have any idea of the scale of loss there? I don't have those figures uh, to hand. Um, I know that a number of organisations have made various estimates about the losses to the aviation sector, what that is in London, um, you know, or what proportion of that is in London, I, I don't have to hand, but um, I can certainly ask colleagues to to put that information and, and write you after the committee. I wonder, Chair, if we ask the GLA Economics Unit to look at the, the, the financial and job loss impact in, in London, because we need specifics about London so we can look at whatever what what our rebuild looks like how much do we need from our from our green recovery you know is it five million jobs or is it two million jobs you know how much retraining what's the cost i think somebody needs to do that specific piece of work so we have some idea of, of what we're asking for just to just to reassure you that work is being looked at i just can't give you the answer for the aviation sector or for that general sector right now because i know it's it has been and is being looked at um yeah. I, I get that but the, the, I, I fully understand that, that's why I'm asking the chair to pursue Hi. that information. You, you're, you're the environment, I, I would ask you for that information. That's why I'm saying, chair, could we pursue the economics unit for that very specific breakdown of the risk to London economy from loss of air travel and all manner of things? 
Yes, it, it may be that um, Shirley's able to point us towards some, uh, some, some data on work that's already being done, but if, there, the, if that's not enough, uh, then, Sean, of course, we can follow that up um, through the economic unit. Thank you, Chair. Um, one last question, Shirley. Will the Mayor lobby the government to, to prevent airlines from being exempt from passenger duty and other carbon taxes? To be exempt? Yeah. Uh, the Mayor has been very clear so, that... Excuse, sorry, Shirley. Who's that from? To, to be, <laughs> let me, I missed the word out, which completely <laughs> changes the question. Excuse me. <laughs> Will the Mayor lobby the government to prevent airlines from becoming exempt from passenger <laughs> duty and other carbon taxes excuse me excuse me the mayor is very clear that um the aviation sector is is, is important to london you, you talked about jobs and and so on however they have a responsibility to contribute to to london's environment um uh, environmental footprint and, and globally in fact um, so we would expect them to, to do, as many other sectors have done, is reduce much more aggressively their carbon emissions, look to, you talked about noise, what can they do about noise, uh, and, and so on. So we have asked government to look at um, how they might look at, for example, using various instruments, whether it's taxation, fiscal instruments or other instruments, to make sure that their impact on the environment is reduced. Okay. What has the mayor done? Because you, you made a, co a comment early on <clears throat> in your opening statement about um, the financial challenge that London and all its authorities face. But going forward, this our incomes could be changed permanently. You know, like I said, we have a visitor, a visitor economy. Who's to say it comes back to the size that it used to be? Because you said we don't want to return to business as usual, which includes an awful lot of flights. So if it's not business it, as usual, how are we going to get back to that level of financial income? Is there any roadmap? Uh, are, are you, as the Deputy Mayor for Environment, looking for a roadmap that supports <laughs> our economic development? Is it being done in other parts of the GLA group? What is the roadmap to get back to the level of income that will give the Mayor monies to spend on these initiatives? Well, I think um, we're all facing these challenges, as is government. You know, the, the amount of borrowing that the, the, the government has has had to undertake is absolutely you know you know astronomical and we're all looking to ways and a roadmap to get back to to the sorts of um funding levels that are needed to support um you know the the, the sort of growth prospects the economic and socially just uh, recovery that we're looking at so these are matters for um that the, that the mayor is working with london councils on through the recovery board uh working with many of those um institutions and organisations like London First, um, you know, Transport for London and others um, to, to look at, and also with government. Um, I've talked about, with, you know, the estimate of funding that we need to, to invest in, in London to reach um, the, the sort of Paris Agreement goals of keeping London to, to uh, a 1.5C um, uh, compliant um, pathway. Um, but these are, these are, you know that the methods of doing that are still being looked at so i can't give that to you now but i think to be assured that people are looking at how we do that okay i i just asked because obviously unprecedented times and i think a roadmap is a use, useful reference point for what we do about our green agenda what do we do e eco economically caroline and i both caroline and i both sit on the economics committee and we are asking several series of questions about how do we come back because there's a tension here isn't there there's a tension between business as usual and our green our green recovery kicking in quickly enough to support job generation. But um, thank you, Chair. That's enough from me. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblymember Bailey. I'm now going to bring in Assemblymember Gavron, who is going to be looking at uh, green spaces and, and slightly on water security as well. Hello. Good morning. Um, maybe it's good afternoon, Shirley. Okay. I've, got, um, yeah. <laughs> I've, got a, I've got a question on on one question on water and the rest are all on open space. Okay. Um, the water the water questions really is how has um, how has the pandemic um, affected Thames Water's ability to provide us with reliable sources of water? Um well they really have coped. <laughs> they they have coped well, I think 
during the, the pandemic and lockdown, we, we've been having, um, as with um, many other groups, weekly calls to keep an eye on, you know, are they um, mobilising their operations to deal with the impacts on staff, for example, um, on supplies of chemicals, um, and then just generally how they were going to do with sort of carrying on with leakage repair and other things uh, in, in a way that was sort of um, complying with guidance on social, uh, on being socially distant. Um, and that's worked very well. And, and you know, they, they have managed to keep going. Uh, we, we brought to, say, to a safe stop some of our programmes with them, for example, the drinking water fountains programme, so that they could concentrate on making sure those essential services um, continued for Londoners. And as far as uh, I'm aware there was there were there were no problems um, in terms of leakage. You know, we I think there was towards the end of um, this sort of period. I think in the last month or so, there was a, a major burst, uh, obviously at um, um, on the North Circular, I believe. Um, and we've written to to Thames to talk about the you know how people have really tried to to deal with with lockdown and with people trying to get back to work you know and that that wasn't again very helpful so in the usual way we've been holding um Thames Water to account on that and we're the mayor is due to meet with the new incoming chief executive um in the autumn and in, in in sometime in the autumn uh when she starts fine thank you for that I, I mean I was aware also that there was um I think our briefing says anyway 25,000 people were affected by um, um, a, it was a, a burst pipe, I think, um, in one part of London um, during the pandemic, and of course that's that's really very difficult then because there's no hand, there was no water, there's no hand washing and so on, yeah. and that's particular affects people during a pandemic, and it did actually bring home to me, and also what you've just said, it mm -hmm. doesn't matter how many, how much infrastructure you have, if your pipes are going to burst, then. It doesn't, you know, that's that's the weak point. And dealing with the leakage is really important, I think. And we need to put more pressure on Thames Water to deal with that. Because I know they always think there's an economic level, you know, where it doesn't work economically for them to go on dealing with the leakages. But it's such a weak point for London. Anyway, that's a yes, comment. it is, absolutely. It is. And, and the mayor has been putting a lot of pressure on, on uh, the, the sort of interim chair, um, and chief executive and and now with the new chief executive we work with the regulator of what um and um about the financial settlement and the fact that it wasn't enough um yes. we've asked for more funding from the investors um to to make sure that the the you know to catch up on the sort of slow pace of leakage and the underinvestment in london in fact you know it's um, a bit like the energy um efficiency argument many um suppliers have been looking at tackling leakage outside of London because they, they think it's easier, which has meant that we're at a, at a disadvantage. So we've been asking the regulator and, and the, the financial uh, owners of, of Thames to, to redress that. And as part of that, we've agreed um, and Offort has backed us on creating a London specific set of indicators so that we can more closely see what, what sort of levels of work and investment and performance Thames Water are undertaking. So I think, you know, the mayor has been in a lot to, to try and push Thames Water to do much more and catch up really on, on these issues, um, um, and including making sure that we've got reliable uh, supplies for, for the future. Just and of course, we also what? have our retrofit programmes that we've been looking at to reduce water usage alongside our, our energy efficiency programmes as well. So at the same time, looking at how we might look to reduce demand um, both in our existing developments, but also in new developments through the London Plan. Very, very good. good. Thank you. Also, just a small point, because you picked up on the water fountains. Are water fountains medically safe? So we've been asking um, um, the Science and Technology Advisory Committee, is, is, is the name, to, to give us sort of um, evidence or, or confirm that's the case. And I don't think, uh, unless Andrew, you've heard anything um, yet, because we're waiting, there's a sort of pipeline of, of, of advice. So until they are confirmed, we're, we're, you know, we're, we won't be reopening them. Andrew? 
We have preliminary outputs from Stack actually at the moment. We're just waiting for those to be completely verified. Um, but they do recommend that it's those uh, fountains be frequently cleaned and that they have a very clear signage on how they should be used. And we're developing what that signage should entail with Public Health England and then returning to Stack to ensure that that's sufficient. But that's likely to involve hand sanitizing before and after use of the, uh, the fountain button. And then if that's not possible, using the back of your hand, your knee or your elbow to touch the fountain because it's all about the surface uh, touching, not to do with the water transmission at all. So um, we're trying to mitigate that risk as much as possible and bring those fountains back online because uh, Stack and Public Health England have recognised that the availability of water to the public is is better value than, than the risk from the, the surface uh, touching of the button. Thank you. OK, that's good to hear. Um, then I want to move on to open space. Mm -hmm. which is also, Shirley, you've actually you have you have said several things about um, open space during the pandemic, but just to sort of go into a bit more depth, what, you know, what have been the experience really of Londoners who've really, you know, even more than ever wanted access to nature and access to open space during the pandemic, and what's been, you know, what what have you absorbed from that? What have been some of the lessons from that? I think I think we've all been. Um just i just well start again it's um absolutely clear that that um the value that people ascribe to open spaces has, has rocketed during um the the pandemic and lockdown so lots of people were aware that they had a park or a green space in their area but probably didn't really use them because you know daily life go to work blah blah, blah. so lockdown has forced people to explore locally and then actually understand the value of those spaces for um just for their own well-being but also just being experienced you know experiencing nature um every day you know as you go out for your for your your, your you know the then hour of permitted exercise mm -hmm. you start to to look and see what's on your doorstep on your street the street trees through to what you might see in your local pocket park or or your bigger parks or along the river if you if you were able to to, to, to have access to that so mm -hmm. so phenomenal and that's what people have been telling us i think um and we've seen very high levels of usage you know conversely from the park managers that that you know the difficulty has been to to, to how do you um enable people to use those um open spaces um in a way that was safe for them to use and didn't um, encourage sort of transmission of COVID to, to other people. Um, and when we've been told to lock down playgrounds and public toilets and so on. So again, I should, you know, use this opportunity to really pay tribute to the local authority um, parks managers and park staff and all the cleaners, street cleaners and so on, who've absolutely made a difference um, to 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 really dealing with, with, with the pandemic. And, and what that's meant then is, is the investment that the mayor has been putting into London on green spaces and making sure, for example, that the targets that we have to make London greener, you know, the the, the designation we have of, you know, of being a national park city, and um, we're coming up to the anniversary this week, um, because of the policies and programmes that we put in place, you know, continue because we recognise how important they are for people, um, uh, people's health and, and well-being. Um, let alone for, for the other environmental benefits that these bring from, you know, carbon sequestration, reducing flood risk um, and being able to mitigate flood risk, um, you know, encouraging biodiversity um, and protecting wildlife and so on. So so these are all things that, that are really live for us. And, you know, and I would say that this is absolutely critical to the recovery efforts that, that, that we are undertaking. So as part of the uh, London Recovery Board, um, they've adopted, as, as we talked about, the environment uh, golden thread. But within that, we've talked about the Green New Deal, and the Green New Deal absolutely includes the improvement of public, so, uh, public, um, the public realm, greening our public realm. So you know, it's, we're not able to create new big parks in 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 the whole of London, but you know, greening our infrastructure. And I know the committee's done a lot of work in this area um, on. Um, making sure that we have more trees and making sure that we have you know that, that we um, protect our green belt all of those things are going to be absolutely critical to our work uh, going forward yes thank you just going back to the parks um in, sorry about my in terms sure. of access in terms of access to the um to parks mm -hmm. um i think quite a lot of people were not able to use parks because really because of the locking down of toilets and that's sort of older people, people with disabilities and so mm -hmm. on. Um, 
what, what's happening about the, uh, you know, the work on the terms of unlocking toilets in parks? Um, so we've been working through uh, the Parks Collaboration Group, which is um, uh, ourselves, the London Local Authorities, London Councils, Parks for London, uh, which is an NGO, they're all parks um, and others. And I'll get Andrew uh, Jones to talk a little bit more about this. Um, and they've been looking at how we start to open up some of these spaces. So, you know, you remember there was a lot of um, discussion about closing park benches down and, and people's ability to use mm -hmm. them. They, they weren't able to, to walk very far. My understanding is that public toilets are being reopened now. I'm not sure whether that's true across London, but Andrew, I don't know if you were able to comment on that. Andrew? Yeah, yeah. Hi. Um, can you see me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yes. So the situation is, as Shirley said, they are, I mean, obviously you've got a range of organisations managing parks and green spaces across mm -hmm. London. You've got the, uh, the, mm -hmm. the, the boroughs plus Royal Parks, mm -hmm. uh, LLDC and City of London. And uh, most of them are, I mean, it's, it, it does vary between organisation managing it and the type of the facility mm -hmm. they're, they're managing. But uh, more and more, I mean, I was on a call this morning and more and more of them are opening those toilet facilities and play areas and gyms as well. Uh, obviously, there's clear signage in terms of how they should be used. I think the mm. ones that aren't being opened are those where they made a, uh, a risk assessment and decided that they couldn't follow the current guidelines on social distancing and, cl and cleanliness. But uh, a lot of them, are, there are far more open than there had been in the past. So uh, it's moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. It has made me think, you know, that we ought to be able to have, you know, te just in case kind of thing, we ought to be able to have a stock of temporary um, toilets that we can, public lavatories, that we could put in spaces if we needed them. But that's just an aside. I wanted to move on to green space and, and, um, and talk a little bit more about um, barriers for Londoners to, to green space. And I just was, we've got... I think the benchmark in the London plan is that you should have access to nature, green space, in some form or another, every 400 metres. Well, that's, that's not a very long walk. And I'm just wondering, there are parts, there are many parts of London where I think we wouldn't be able to achieve that. And I know that um, it also says in the London plan that areas that are deficient in open space should, green spaces is, should actually... Um, you know, prioritise a strategy for that. How are those? Are you are you sort of pushing on those strategies, Shirley and Andrew? Are they are they coming along? Because we're going to have to create more green space, I think. Uh, yes, and I think um, there, 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 are, there are two ways we've been doing that through through the development planning process. So we have the new urban greening factor. Uh, we're just waiting for the London plan to be signed off by the Secretary of State, but that will require developers to think about. Um, you know how they are greening their infrastructure and that's not really going to be possible i think um at the, the levels we set it without including some sort of green space green roofs green walls for, for wildlife but but sort of access to green space within the development and i think developers are recognizing how important it is you know anecdotally we've seen sort of people talking about um homes that don't have access to to some sort of outdoor space whether it's balconies or a green you know a sort of roof terrace or or a garden you know, are not, you know, are, um, are, are selling less well or being renting, uh, you know, not being prioritised for renting, I guess, as people value that outdoor space. And in terms of our sort of um, work with local authorities and our funding programmes at the GLA, you know, we've been really looking at the work that we've done on um, mapping where those areas of open space deficiency are and targeting our funding in those areas. We've been asking local authorities to do the same. Um, and I talked about the 400 hectares that we've managed to uh, implement of, of, of space, green space um, across the, the last um, few years um, over the last term for the mayor. Where, and this where can is something... we see evidence of that? Sorry, where can we see evidence of the, you know, the, where is it reported where the 400 acres are? Hectares, uh, was it? Acres? Hectares. Uh, hectares. It's, it should be on our mapping, shouldn't it, Andrew? And I'm not sure yeah, whether so... the, that so, that that area is made up of all the projects we've supported um so if you, if you go on to the uh, gla website all the projects we've supported are on there um in terms of location so you can find that information this out is, this is new green space no it, it's it's a new or improved green space 
So it'd right. be where our projects have taken place. So. Yes. And uh, my, my point about the local authorities, are they, I mean, you're doing the mapping, but are they working in what way? I mean, they're, they're producing strategies, they're doing their own mapping? So, um, I mean, the new London plan encourages uh, local authorities to produce green space strategies. So uh, currently we're, we're, we're producing some guidance on how to help boroughs produce those strategies. And we're working with some of those who are more advanced on that. So at the moment, we're, for example, we're working with Hackney and, and they're preparing their green space strategy. Sorry, their green infrastructure strategy. Uh, and we uh, hopefully, you know, get some exemplars that we'd expect other boroughs to follow. Mm. Yeah, and as, as boroughs are developing, you know, you know, many of them have declared climate emergencies. So as they're developing their plans to tackle the climate emergency, you know, we 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 have um, we held a workshop earlier this year where we talked about some of the programs and the policies that the mayor is is promoting, and green space, more green space, and and um, public realm improvements is is a key part of that uh, issue that local authorities should be addressing. Um, and back to the sort of conversation we had on street space improvements, if some of those can become legacy improvements, then greening those is going to be a key part of uh, improving access for people to, to um, outdoor green space. Excellent. There's a lot that can be done, probably by working very closely with TfL mm -hmm. in terms, or maybe it is the local authorities as well as TfL, but in terms of parklets, those little little. You know, okay. oh. putting vegetation and little mini parks That's instead right. of parking bays, and also pocket parks, little bits of land. Mm -hmm. and presumably, that you are lobbying TfL for that, aren't you? Yeah, so we're working very closely with them on the street space plan. So um, that's been a key part of the work that Andrew and the team have been talking to mm. TfL about. But obviously, these are, as we talked about earlier, these are emergency implementations. You know, to 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 deal with COVID. But as um, you know. We have been talking about two boroughs and Transport for London about um, how we might make those permanent if people like them. And we would like to encourage that they're made more permanent um, following consultation. And part of it will be how do we make sure that they are um, greener um, uh, and incorporate, you know, okay. um, sustainable urban drainage and so yeah. on. OK. Natural England, um, July the 5th, I think it was, published a report with, with their partners, which... Um, which, no, it wasn't Natural England, sorry, though I'm sure they were one of the partners. It was the National Trust. Trust, and yeah. It published a report about how a number of different um, ways of making sure that um, people in cities had access, urban areas, had access to, to green space, but more than that, to regional parks, to woodland and so on. And one of their suggestions was to make sure that the green belts, and obviously talking about green belts generally, but we in London, our green belt, could be made much more accessible. They talked about creating regional parks. I have my eyes on those golf clubs, you know. Um, <laughs> I've been I've been trespassing on a golf club <laughs> recently because I, I just think it's so shocking that you can't go into a golf club. <laughs> anyway, and it's miles and miles and miles of green space. But anyway, regional parks and more more woodland. And but the main point is that I wanted to make was working with the transport authority our transport authority to make sure that we have connections to this space mm -hmm. so that people don't use who don't have car you know they have access so you can give people access to the green space i.e the green belt and i wondered whether we're doing any work on that um again we've been it's working with tfl yeah so so again working with will and and colleagues at transport for london you know at, the, the focus i guess has been on on sort of commuter um routes really um, helping people to, to move around, but uh, initially, but lockdown, as we pointed out, has, re has really highlighted the the fact that people want to 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 stay locally and and you know having discovered the sort of area around them, how how might they use that? So some of the work that we're looking on street space uh, the, through the street space plan is opening up those routes, um, as I said, initially through temporary measures to enable people to cycle and walk, and that will include um, areas of green space, whether it's the green belt or their local. Uh, local regional park. Mm -hmm. So I do think there's something to be Nikki, done could with I, TfL. Nikki, Nikki, could I just say um, we're getting quite tight on time. So if you okay, could I've wind up, that question. would be really helpful. Okay. So, well, I've got one more question on this. Just on skills, mm -hmm. um, there are obviously a lot of skills involved in opening up more green space. And I just wondered, are you working on that conservation skills? 
more this, emphasis on green yeah, space skills? Absolutely. So the London Green Spaces Commission uh, has been looking at um, a number of areas uh, around how we might improve the management of green spaces and parks. And one of the, er the issues they've highlighted is, um, you know, the, the obvious opportunity we have for retraining people into into new new green infrastructure jobs. So, so that is absolutely a key area. And again, part of the Green New Deal um, approach is looking at public realm improvements and that um, uh, the, the crossover with jobs and training as well. So some of the work that we've been doing with our colleagues in the economic team, you know, the skills team as well. Um, Andrew, I don't know if there's anything more that you want to add on that. No, no, I think it's, as uh, Shirley said, that the Commission has been looking at that and, and uh, uh, see it as an important area and it would be, a, you know, as a part of a, a Green New Deal and Green Recovery in terms of jobs and skills, the green spaces, green infrastructure sector, we would, we would form part of that. Excellent. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Yeah, Thank you, Nikki. Um, Tony, um, Assembly Member Arba, you had wanted uh, to come in on the back of the green spaces. If you yes, still yes, want to, I if want you could to... be quite brief, that would be fantastic. No, no substantial addition. The only thing that I want to say is the success of the Pocket Park scheme. Before this meeting, I actually looked at the list of the Pocket Parks, uh, which, which we have. But the one question I have for Shirley, we did mention in passing the New London Plan, I would like to see it as a regular condition for consent when the mayor is involved with planning matters to say that the 400 metres uh, rule should be rigorously employed for the provision not just of large open areas but pocket parks as well. I'm thinking of some very substantial large developments which are in the pipeline where there are public inquiries uh, coming on. One of my own patch, for example, the brewery at Mortlake. Um, and I uh, would very much like to see uh, that the mayor, as the planning authority for London, actually takes all of these matters into account. That's it, Chairman. Thank you. Um, uh, Shirley, do you want to come back to that or should we move to the next? Uh, well, uh, the mayor takes everything in the London plan very seriously, so I, I'm sure he will be looking at those things, considering them as as, as the uh, planning authority. Um, and I'm very happy to follow up with Jules to find out what you know if there is anything. But you know, I can't really comment on that particular issue. Oh, well, of course not. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm now going to bring in Assembly Member Cooper, who I hope is here, um, uh, uh, here to I talk am. about retrofit. Hello. I'll pop back um, out. Leonie, if you can um, be very mindful of time, because we're working to a very tight I, deadline today. Yes, I noticed everyone else was rambling on, so you'd like me to be very, very nice and quick. Well, we, we moved the case. meeting to suit you. So. Who, who, who am I to criticise my fellow Assembly members for rambling? Um, yeah, so Shelley, I wanted to move to the other really big area that's so important in terms of um, addressing the climate emergency and reducing emissions after transport um, and that's the whole issue of buildings because they're the second biggest source of um, operational emissions um, partly because our buildings are so leaky and also partly because our the heating systems um, are, are pretty rubbish and need upgrading as you know um, now you know you had a, originally a target of doing 2600 homes with energy efficiency measures to be completed by 2021 um, and I just wondered um, whether the pandemic has had an impact on um, delivery. Um, you know, has there been a bit of a go slow on that? How much do you now anticipate that will get done? And how much are you um, anticipating that you're going to be spending? Um, and I know that some of the programmes were being funded via various different EU budgets. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a bit of a discussion earlier on about, um, I think it was raised by Assemblymember Bailey, who was saying, how much do you want from government? And, of course, the amount of tax that London has paid to government, um, probably the amount that you want from government might just be a small proportion of that. But what are we going to do if we're not going to be getting money from the EU? Will we be getting some of our taxes back from government to cover these necessary works? So uh, I couldn't give you um, details of revised targets for... Um, for our retrofitting programs that we have at the moment, because we are working through now 
what uh, what we can do. Um, so thing you could then send us afterwards, do you think, once you've... I did, I did wonder if you might say that, because obviously, you know, it's a very live situation. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we're sort of gradually unlocking even now, so it's probably quite hard to maybe say at this point, but we'd, we'd really appreciate that. Yeah, very happy to, 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 to send you something afterwards. Right. Um, but, but as I mentioned before, you know, the team working with the, the contractors have been making sure that the pipeline carries on. So through our, our warmer homes advice services, making sure people, you know, um, are being channeled through into to our work pro uh, into the, the retrofit programs we have, for example, for for homes. Um, the projects are uh, we, we were managed. We managed to avail ourselves of the last tranche of EU funding uh, for, for most of those uh, retrofit programs. But but you're right now that avenue is closed to us. We need to be looking at how we mobilise private finance uh, into these areas, as well as public sector finance. So, you know, ideally through a, a government stimulus package to to mm. retrofit the whole of the country. And, you know, London um, has very many homes, as you pointed out. Uh, one in 10, one in 11 people are, are, you know, households are in fuel poverty. So tackling um, the retrofitting of our homes not only tackles uh, carbon emissions, but it will lower fuel, bell, uh, fuel bills, make people's homes more healthy, uh, you know, healthier places to live, which, you know, helps people come out of hospitals and stop sort of beds being used for, for people who, who aren't, uh, aren't allowed to be discharged unless they've got a sort of healthy home to go to. Um, so these are all things that we've been um, advocating to government. We know roughly how much money we need to invest in London. We talked about the 10 billion. Um, for for retrofit, um, and then that's not the only part of the, the the retrofit challenge. You know, that's just our homes. We also have our public sector buildings and commercial buildings that also need to be retrofitted. And um, we've been again lobbying government to do much more in this in terms of setting standards, minimum energy efficiency standards, and devolving the powers to the mayor to um, to set standards and to enforce as well, um, because. Many businesses are trying to do the right thing. Obviously, the, the economic situation that, that's coming on to us is going to make things difficult. So we want to be able to help those businesses and help, uh, you know, own homeowners, help public sector authorities, whether it's schools or housing associations, to really tackle something that we know will bring jobs. We know it has many jobs. Uh, we can help people retrain from some of the sectors that we know are no longer going to be um, supported. Um, uh, and they're very sort of easy, quick, I think, retraining jobs as well. So that, you know, it's not something that, that would take a, a huge amount of time. There are lots of different jobs involved in retrofit, but, you know, a lot of them from fitting and retrofitting is a, a sort of um, a, a skilled, um, but, you know, not like requiring a, X number well, of years to retrain. Absolutely. I mean, as you rightly point out, you know, as we emerge from lockdown and a lot of people who've been furloughed may well be losing their jobs. So getting retrained or even doing some of the more unskilled roles where um, people have been using the shorthand build back better. Um, and, in, and in this context, you know, obviously it's literally building back. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wondered across the construction industry, um, how much of a set, setback lockdown has been um, uh, in terms of the restrictions? Because I know there were a lot of discussions at the beginning about whether or not building sites should close or stay open. I had a lot of constituents corresponding about, you know, getting to work was overcrowded and then other people saying they couldn't get to work and so on and so forth. And I, I just wondered if you give us a flavour for, for where we are on that. Thank you. Uh, in terms of retrofitting or in terms of the general construction setter? In terms of retrofitting, um, I think maybe if I can get James um, to, to comment on our particular programmes that, that we had, because I know that we work very closely with Turner and Townsend, I think. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, yeah. Thank you, Jelly. I mean, the, a lot of the retrofitting we do is um, under the banner uh, of construction anyway. So, And this sector hasn't suffered from the prolonged lockdown restrictions um, as some of the other sectors like restaurants and pubs and other things. Uh, so some of the restrictions were relaxed on the 10th of May by the Prime Minister's uh, announcement yeah. on that Sunday, I think you probably remember. Yeah. Um, and that allowed us to then resume some, uh, some of our jobs. Uh, and now we're in a position where warmer homes, um, our retrofit accelerator programmes and solar together have, have, have resumed pretty much all of the jobs. However, where 
Um, we have issues, for example, like uh, households in self-isolation. Um, we will not uh, be attended during those total sort of that total period, or if they're in self-isolation. And household shielding, of course, will not be attended unless they have no means of getting heating uh, for water, for bathing, for cleaning, etc. Um, all other whole house assessments uh, were put on hold originally, unless where. Um, it was to do with the protection of safety. So that's why uh, Shirley was referring to earlier about warmer homes attending to failing heating systems and broken boilers. Sure. So on the 10th of May, we then opened it up and uh, resumed the wider scope of that work. So essentially, you're in a better place, James, um, and thanks, Shirley, that's a good idea to bring James in on the detail there. We're in a better place, James, in terms of uh, retrofit than we may have been in terms of construction um, sites that sort of closed down and have reopened again or, or sort of went on to a sort of trickle of work. But because of the nature of what we're doing, where people are shielding um, or sheltering, um, that has then caused some problems. Do you know what percentage... Um, that has impacted, or is that something that you might be able to send us afterwards? May not be something you know off the top of your head. Well, it's it's a moving number, um, yeah. and the last time I looked, it was about fifteen percent. Um, now, uh, I should that's say the the other approach that's then. only mm, that, that's only from warmer homes, though. Uh, many of our other programs, like the retrofit accelerator programs, also target organisations like universities, hospitals, and London boroughs which have obviously been financially impacted by the outbreak. Yes. Um, so they might experience changing priorities as a result of budget, you know, reprioritization in, in the future. So it's difficult to anticipate mm. how COVID has had an impact on both kind of the pace of delivery and the program KPIs. So I hope to have a, a much better sort of, you know, full impact assessment in the coming months. Oh, OK. So, yeah, so that's quite difficult because I know a lot of people, obviously, in local authorities were working from home and furloughed and getting phones answered. And then some people were transferred over into doing other duties relating to, um, you know, running community hubs and and making sure that, you know, people who were sheltering were, were, were being got to. Um, so presumably then you're going to do that full assessment. Then we've got the business of originally people were expecting to be reimbursed for all their covid related additional activities and now the government's saying 75 pence in the pound so some might be a bit short are we expecting both to see an increase in the number of retrofits both home retrofits and and schools are you expecting there to be any barriers then with some of these partners perhaps as we come further out of the lockdown and we're able to really restart economic activity well just to comment on that i think just yeah and you know obviously the financial impact is still working its way through so yeah. i think it's difficult to comment i think there's def definitely a genuine desire to mm -hmm. um to take action on on retrofits you know from from all of those sectors and we've estimated how much money that we could uh could could get moving if if um if there are financial difficulties through the summer statement for example um mm -hmm. i'm not sure yeah until people have just looked through their finances and worked out what they're doing, and the, just like we're doing at the GLA, what the sort of reprioritizing are, uh, what their new priorities might be. But I think you know we have pushed very hard that 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 that, that retrofitting is going to be a key way of, of tackling a whole host of things that are relevant for whether it's individuals or homeowners or businesses in terms of fuel bills um, uh, as well as carbon emissions that many have, uh, have signed up to to tackling. Mm. Would you agree with me then that um, it would be short-sighted for the government not to put some of this seed corn money into this? You know, it's quite small amounts, I think, that would then kickstart it because then they, you know, it would pay for itself in terms of people going back to work and starting to pay those taxes that then goes back to the Treasury. It's surely something that's a win-win and it pays for itself and it gets the economy moving again. Well, it sounds like common sense to me. <laughs> mm. OK, um, thanks very much. Sorry, James, you wanted to add I was something. just going to say, of course, around 60% of expenditure on retrofit goes into labour. So it's really about generating strong employment growth. That's why we're focusing so much on this. Um, you know, and, and we know it's one of the fastest growing sectors, so it makes economic sense to really invest. Yeah. Thank, thanks very much. That That's great. I'll leave it there, Caroline, because uh, I don't want to, uh, you know, ramble on either. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Assemblymember Cooper. So I'm now going to bring in 
Assemblymember Arbour, um, who is going to be asking some questions. Well, the next section is waste management and energy, but I think um, Assemblymember Arbour is starting with the um, energy questions. That's, that's absolutely right, Chairman. I have to say it was refreshing to hear from officers and Leone talking about retrofit. But of course, that's a programme that would have continued whether or not we had had the pandemic uh, or not. That programme will continue. But the reason I raise it is that's the only time during this whole couple of hours discussion that we have had. We've kind of talked about the economic effects of the pandemic. Much of the work that um, has been happening on the environment could kind of sound smug uh, when we talked about the improvement in the uh, levels of pollution, how wonderful it is to have the bright sun and so on. I would only say this to you, no point in having uh, an improved uh, atmosphere, lots of bright sun and so on, if the city centres are empty, nobody's in the shops, people aren't being employed. I'm sure if you were to ask citizens whether or not which of those two things they would prefer, uh, being unemployed or having a, a brief improvement in the level of pollution, I'm pretty certain I'd know what they'd answer. And I'm sorry we haven't spent more time on discussing those aspects of this. Anyway, in relation to the set questions that I have uh, been given <laughs> uh, on energy, uh, we have been told, and you know that I've been very sceptical about octopus uh, ever since we went for them. Very interesting to see uh, what has been happening in Bristol. Uh, I don't just mean throwing statues into the river or anything of that kind, but in relation to their energy uh, uh, programme, uh, where the uh, belief that it would ever become self-sufficient and indeed uh, income producing for the whole of Bristol has been put back. So I to ask Shirley whether or not the demand that there has been for uh, Octopus suggests in any way that we're going to be able to break even in the near future. So we, before I answer that, I should just point out that we talked a little bit, uh, actually quite a lot through this, this um, discussion about a green recovery, not being exclusively different from a from a, a jobs recovery, and it's absolutely clear that the mayor has said that as through through the work of the, the recovery board. The ZEC taxi uh, example I gave talked about inward investment into the UK, uh, which is bringing jobs and uh, growth as well as tackling uh, the reduction of emissions. Well, sorry, of your... I, I, I want to inter I want to interrupt on that uh, precise point. Kind of boasted about the. Uh, importance of the LEZ, the truth of the matter is that if we did not, uh, in other words, during this crisis, we did not have an LEZ, that would make things very much cheaper uh, for those people who want to do business in London. And I just cannot understand why the mayor has not suggested, or in, and in this particular case, it's you acting for the mayor, have not suggested that in fact there's a moratorium uh, on the LEZ so long as the pandemic lasts. You might well, like to address that, Shirley. Uh, as we talked about earlier in the in the conversation, um, we cannot exchange one public health crisis with another, um, and we have made uh, the mayor has made available uh, scrappage schemes which uh, we've asked government to support uh, nationally uh, to no avail. Um, and that includes many mayors from uh, cross party seeking support because we know that this uh, would accelerate the, um, uh, the, the, the the polluting fleet coming out of, of the... Um... Yeah, the it, scrappage means that retailers, for example, and other business people in London would have to put up money up front. Not having the LEZ in operation means that instantly they would have a boost to their income. No, because they've had plenty of time to, to prepare. We provided support for this. Um, and these are things that many businesses are, are progressing very fast on, on um, implementing. We've seen good levels of compliance with the low emission in uh, zone, ultra low emission zone in central London. And we're seeing uh, growing levels of compliance as people realise that their customers want it, their staff want uh, cleaner vehicles. 
Um, and as we talked about, how this drives growth in, in, in new... You and, I are, not, you and, and new I are not going to agree on this one. Can we get back to the breaking even, please, of Octopus? <laughs> so what I was going to say about the example that you've given with Bristol is that it's it's not like for like. So um, the, the model that Bristol and others have done uh, have been fully licensed supply companies, if, if I'm correct, James. Um, and so they have invested a lot more funding to provide guarantees um, for um, for those companies. And we took uh, some flack, I think, for taking our time in going down uh, the selection route for, for London Power, which is why we went down the white label route, which means that we don't have to um, provide as much uh, funding or backing as, as uh, Nottingham or Bristol have had to do. And I think that that's the right choice. In terms of breaking even, we've said we hope to break even within the first four uh, years of the um, contract. Um, and it's too early to say what our numbers are. We'll be publishing those in due course um, once well, they've been verified. Due, how long is due course? I was expecting them this month. Uh, they will be this month. So that's less than a fortnight then? Yeah. You but must I have some... You must those numbers will be the first set of numbers on customer yes. numbers um, and that will be in the midst of uh, a pandemic where you know we've not been able to do any marketing etc so and we've always said that if you're going to judge a company you have to judge it uh, over uh, at least a year's worth of data and i'm sure that uh, assembly member arbor will take that in heart when he's talking about the numbers well, of course, of, co of course, of course, I will, I, I will take that on. But you talk about then no opportunity for marketing. The truth of the matter is, Octopus is undergoing a very heavy. If, uh, I don't know if you watch television. In in lockdown, I've been uh, watching uh, London Live quite a lot. <laughs> uh, it's doubled its audience, and uh, <laughs> there are lots of advertisements for Octopus Energy. Not once do they mention London. Uh, That's because Octopus Energy is not London Power. Octopus Energy is the supplier for London Power. So what you won't have seen because of the marketing uh, was suspended, uh, because it's London Power that does the advertising. So when we talk about uh, the Mayor's Energy Company, it's London Power, the one with the, the call. All right. Not, not the one with the octopus. Okay. Um uh, I, I won't prolong. I, I won't prolong this uh, any more, uh, Caroline, because I, I know that I will simply uh, get an argument. It may be easier for you uh, to direct the directed questions to Shirley. Um, so I'm passing the buck to you, Caroline. Okay. <laughs> um... Are you saying, that, Tony? Are you saying that London Live has got an audience now of two because you started watching it, so it's doubled in size? That was the inference. It was a joke, but only a little joke. <laughs> so, um, uh, just mo moving on, um, many Londoners' homes are not powered by renewable energy. So, um, do you have any sense of what the environmental impact has been in terms of domestic energy consumption during the lockdown? Um, as in many, many more of us have been living and working from home. So anecdotally, um, obviously with, with um, commercial centres, um, you know, people working from home, you know, the, the commercial energy use uh, has, has dropped quite significantly. But essentially that's been transferred to home. So there, there is some data, and I think James can jump in here about some sort of general stats, but not, uh, I don't think, London-specific data and obviously we're in this is sort of four months into to um you know the sort of spring and summer um hopefully we don't know quite what the the situation will be is if you know if lockdown extends and people carry on working at home which will mean a different use in gas uh, consumption for example james yes sure so um you're absolutely right i mean business and industry demand as expected has gone down but people are spending more time at home uh, working. So domestic use has increased. Uh, several energy companies, quite big ones, have done some smart meter uh, analysis, uh, and they've estimated the increase ranging between 6 and 30%. My own bill's gone up by 17%, uh, you know, if you want to sort of anecdotally. 
Um, now, the timing of energy use, which has been quite interesting, has changed with a reduction in the morning peak. That was a typically when people would switch on their coffee machines, boil their kettles, put on their toasters before going out to work. And instead, the, the aggregate increase has spread across um, sort of nine to five on weekdays with a new peak in energy demand happening around 12 to two, which is lunchtime um, for most at home. Um, as we're heading into the summer, gas usage, um, I think luckily hasn't seen such a large rise. However, with people expected to work from home for the continuing sort of period, it's likely to see, um, they're likely to see higher bills as they're going to autumn and winter. And I think you switch have estimated that households working from home will use in the order of 17% more gas during this winter than if the house was unoccupied. Uh, so I guess in the, in the short term, there is a benefit for customers. That is that there's been a national drop in demand and as a result, energy prices have been lower per unit uh, per kilowatt hour because there's an abundant supply of readily available gas and power on the grid. Um, that's because of the reduced demand in the commercial space. So I think we're recommending that customers switch supplier now to lock in prices for a longer term to benefit from that low rate. That's why London Power, for example, has now got a 24 month fixed uh, option. It's because you can bank in that low price for a longer period of time. And retrofitting your home, you know, to make sure that you're not leaking energy. So maybe not at the moment, but certainly uh, over the winter period. Um, and, and really looking to see how you might reduce energy demand. And, you know, so the uptake of some of our, the work that we're doing on warmer homes, you know, so that the fuel pool um, really get the advice and access to those retrofitting programmes is a key priority for the mayor. Yep. The, one of the things that came up um, uh, in our last meetings back in, back in the autumn um, uh, were the, the, the issue of the, the able to pay sector um, and retrofit and access to funding. Am I right? There is now some government funding that, that is, do you have any sense of how that's going to affect Londoners? Yes, there is. And maybe I can bring Pete Dahl in. I think Pete's on the line to talk a little bit about that. You know, it's not enough. And we talked about this earlier. It's definitely not enough. Um, but Pete, have you got any more specifics? I think, cause we've got a pipeline of something. Yeah. yeah. Hi everyone. Um, so, Two, two sort of pots of money being announced uh, and we're just exploring with Bayes officials how those are going to work. So um, one is to the sort of able to pay market, if you if you like, which is a £5,000 grant, uh, which covers up to two thirds of the cost of energy efficiency measures. Um, so that's things like double glazing, for example, floor and loft insulation, wall insulation. And then also um, the full cost up to £10,000 um, for uh, homes, um, more, more deprived uh, homes. So this is more targeted at the fuel pool, which of course fits uh, very well with our own warmer homes programme. So we're currently exploring uh, how we um, get that opportunity. We take that opportunity for London. So um, yeah, we're, we're basically in discussions with Bayes just to understand a bit more of the details. And, uh, and ideally, ideally, we'd want that money transferred to London so we can use our accelerators to push that out to get going. Otherwise, if, yeah. if individuals have to apply individually, we will never get that money spent. And the requirement is from government is to spend it this financial year. So to make the biggest and quickest improvement, use the existing systems and governance processes that we have that we know are working well in London rather than create something a sort of a bureaucracy that, that 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 means that it won't get spent and just that just to follow sensible. up on that that's about forty thousand homes i think in total if you if you worked out a portion a fair share for london that would be about forty thousand homes forty thousand yeah that's not very many when you think of the number of homes in no. in the whole of london so do you think there's any opportunity to get more of this funding for london so that we can actually tackle some more of the homes Unlikely. I think, you know, this is the point we made earlier, you know, London to, to even get its fair share of funding, which is the 40,000 is a struggle. Um, the quantum isn't enough anyway, you know, for, for to, to do the hundreds of thousands of homes, we need to retrofit a year to tackle fuel poverty and to, to meet our carbon targets. Mm. Um, and that's why we've been lobbying government to say that's not suitable. It's not enough for the UK, let alone for London. 
Um, but, you know, as a start, at least give London its fair share of the funding that you are making available for the country so that we can get on and, and, and implement that. But, yeah, 40,000 uh, is not enough to, to meet our carbon targets or, or tackle fuel poverty. And Sorry. Caroline, could I come in quickly and just ask about the eco funding? Because if the mayor Very lobbied... Very briefly, Nikki. Um, can I? May yeah, I? Can briefly, I? yes. Just if the mayor lobbied for, the, um, for our fair share in London... We have eco- been, yeah. It Sorry, about you... £100 million. How are we getting on with that? Because we, we're, we're not. It's not fair. We know it would be a hundred million a year, I think. Yeah, it'd be twenty-two million a year. Uh, yeah. We, we, yeah. we continue pushing very hard to make sure we get our fair share of all all portions of money. But as Shirley said, I think the key thing is the long and sustained investment in retrofit. So there was a an announcement by um, the Conservative Party in the manifesto of nine point two billion uh, to support retrofit, which um, has yet to emerge, which which would support work over the next, mainly over the next five years, but some over 10 years. And it's important we see that sustained level of, of support for retrofit if we're to get anywhere near our targets. Thank you. Fair enough. Um, Thank you, Caroline. Uh, I've got a clarification from Sean. Um, did you still want your clarification, Sean? Yes, it's just the point that Shirley said the mayor was criticised for taking so long to form the, the energy company. What he's also criticised for is the fact that he went back and he's promised to have a full a full co- energy company, not the white label affair. I personally think the white label affair is probably a better thing. But that- he never said he was going to do that. That's an absolute... Yes, I don't want to call Assemblymember Bailey a liar, but that was not in his well, manifesto. You, you have by saying that. that is what he was I'm afraid it was not in his manifesto, and he never ever said it was going to be a fully... It wasn't. He's never said that. I can photocopy and send you the page from his manifesto. He literally like never said that. I'm sure, trees, I'm sure the deputy yeah. mayor will be happy to confirm that. <laughs> Promise of two billion trees. Good trees, yes. I or eight thousand houses. We're just talking about, about the energy about trees companies and energy companies. I think people go back to the manifesto, and I'm sure I said this at my very first meeting about the trees and on the energy company. That wasn't in the manifesto. Yeah, but it is. It is still yeah. something the mayor said. That's Assembly the member yeah, Bailey. Assembly member Bailey. I think we're going to pause on this. And Assembly member Cooper didn't want to do a clarification. He just wanted to spread misinformation. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I think this has not helped before. Assembly we'll member Bailey for us really. to get to the end of our meeting on time. So I, I, I gave you a, an opportunity in good faith, but I'm, we're we're going to move on. Um, <laughs> We do have a couple of questions on waste management. Um, I'm going to reduce it just to one uh, so that we haven't entirely dropped this um, uh, section, but I am aware it is two o'clock. Um, but just in terms of the, uh, the, the recycling target of achieving 65% of municipal waste recycling by 2030, has there been any... Uh, impact on your ability to meet that target um, during uh, th- from this period um, during the pandemic. Um, in particular, you know, I'm very concerned because so many of the boroughs are not meeting their recycling targets at the moment. Just a very quick answer. We can we can write to you after um, the committee. Um, the boroughs have said I've said have, have tried to maintain services, and that that has carried on. But obviously, that target includes an, a level of commercial waste recycling and that has dropped off because obviously um, if, if businesses aren't you know operating then they're not you know they weren't producing the waste that, that then counts towards that target um, but what we have done is agreed uh, reduction recycling plans with all the 33 boroughs um, which you know if implemented would reduce um, would see a, a further reduction or increase rather in our recycling rate so and uh, a number of boroughs have committed to uh, implement food recycling, for example, for the first time, um, and extending services, uh, including glass recycling and so on. So, um, again, it's probably easy if I write to you um, after the committee, but we're very heartened by that. But obviously the pandemic does need a reassessment. And one of the biggest issues for local authorities is the income problems they're going to be, uh, they are facing now and are going to have. So they're all looking at, um, you know, what the budget implications are. And we've asked the London Waste and Recycling Board to to do a survey uh, of boroughs to find out what the implications are and what their plans are. So when are you expecting that survey to be? At some point, uh, they're only just going out with the survey. So by the time it comes back and they're they're assessed, it's probably in the autumn, I would say. 
Okay. But we'll, I'll, we'll I'll write to confirm that. Follow later. up on that. Yes, that um, sounds good. The um, I mean, obviously, if there's uh, there's been no economic activity, then there's been no waste produced. Um, so if we're talking about the overall waste arisings, um, those broadly have been, I mean, certainly I know for North London Waste Authority, the overall waste arisings have been going down and have not been um, rising as predicted and modelled when they started to build, um, to, to work on building that, uh, the new incinerator there. Do you um, think that there should be a, a kind of a, a carbon review of that incinerator project to, um, in, in light of the pandemic and the changes that are happening to the economy, the, um, you know, it's likely with less economic activity there will be fewer waste arisings? Um, and should we not be reassessing uh, the, that drive to build more incinerator capacity when actually what we need to be doing is uh, composting or anaerobically digesting the food waste, recycling and getting as many of the materials into the circular economy as possible? That, that particular um, incinerator that, that you're talking about, it, uh, you know, we have run its course, I think, in, in able to, to, to stop it. So the... Um, um, there was various judicial reviews, the contract notice has been issued, so they're well underway with that. But what the mayor has been very clear on is no new incineration is needed, which is why he's been challenging the um, uh, the Corrie incinerator, the second incinerator, yeah. on top of the one that is under capacity and underused at, at Belvedere. Um, and we've had per permission to take that, um, I believe, to take that forward. I think we're just waiting for a, a hearing date. Um, Andrew... Um, well, you can probably confirm that. Um, but, you know, that's that's what we should be saying to people. So the focus should be on waste reduction. So it's very heartening if there is less waste being produced. The worry is that, like um, car traffic, that that was a temporary issue. And then, then as people start to get back to work and consumption, that that starts to rise, which is why the work that we've been doing on the sector economy and lobbying government to make sure that, that, that we really push uh, waste reduction and more use of recycling, uh, recyclable materials in, in, uh, by companies is very important. Mm -hmm. Did Andrew want to come in? It was just to confirm, surely is, is correct. Uh, we have been granted permission to, to proceed with the judicial, to, to, sorry, to do just review of the quarry application and we're waiting for a date from the court. Thank you. Perhaps Thanks, you could... Fine, I'm allowed to come in. Uh, briefly, right. Nikki. <laughs> I just wanted to say, because um, there was a, there was a meeting um, of the Edmonton Incinerator Board the other day, and I, I watched it. It's a Zoom, it's a public meeting. And it's very clear, the waste arisings have gone down for the last two years, and recycling levels have gone down. Yeah. And so something's going wrong there. And I fear it'll become, because they're increasing the capacity, it'll become another Belvedere, it'll be under capacity. And there are more incinerators being built not very far away outside London. So my suggestion for Edmonton would be, obviously, they're well on their way, but they should have more than two treatment streams in it. They each do 350,000 tonnes, and they should do what other incinerators do and have perhaps four treatment streams so that as the residual waste goes down, they can decommission the waste streams. Otherwise, it's going to be a stranded asset. And Shirley, it's a good suggestion, though. No. <laughs> we are well. I, I think well, Andrew. We can pick that up maybe with with officers. But uh, I think I'd love you to pick it up. <laughs> Let's modify. Okay, I'm with. I'm going to I'm going to take charge here. Um, it's seven minutes past two. Um, Shirley, thank you very very much um, for your time and. Um, and your officers' time. Um, that has been incredibly um, helpful and, uh, and, and useful. And um, uh, yes, I need to ask the committee to note the report and the subsequent discussion. Can we note it? Thank you. And ask the committee to delegate authority to me as chair in consultation with the party group lead members to agree any output arising from the discussion. Agreed. Agreed. 
Um, and in addition to the recommendation on the agenda, I'd like to propose that the committee prepares a joint response to the Department for Transport's consultation on creating a plan to decarbonise transport with the London Assembly's Transport Committee. Do members have any questions or comments related to this proposal? Send us the text of what we're proposing, Caroline, for party group leads to look at, yeah? Uh, of course, yes. A okay. Absolutely. I I, I'm happy to put something in on transport, but I would like us also to send something to the government on um, buildings and putting more support into that area, because I just think that whole area of building back better and the amount of input it gives to the economy on the retrofit side, we so urgently need to get on with this. And I think it's a great contributor both to building back better, but also building up people's jobs again and all of that area, as I said in my questioning. So I, I've, doing something jointly with transport is fine, but I'd like us to do something as a committee about that, maybe jointly with housing, if you like. Uh, that's an interesting um, suggestion. Shall I take that away and um, and come back take to the party, party group, group leads? leads. Some discussion. Absolutely. Lovely. Thank you. Um, so then, uh, can I finally ask the committee to note its work programme as agreed under delegated authority by the chair of the GLA Oversight Committee on the 13th of May? No. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And delegate authority to me as chair in consultation with party group lead members to agree a joint response with the chair of the... Ah, I'm so sorry, I've just read that again. Uh, we had already done that, I'm sorry. Uh, the date of the next meeting of the committee will be decided by the London Assembly in due course. There are no urgent items of business, so thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.